Thanks for attending today's Fireside Chat with GTR Event Technology President and CEO, Travis Tucker. I'm Noah Simons, the President and CEO of the Upstate Capital Association of New York. Usually my friend and colleague Maureen Balatori does these interviews, but she asked me to jump in today for today's conversation with Travis. Thanks for being here, Travis. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm really excited, actually. I, I love Maureen. She's fantastic. But seeing as that we're in the we, we play in the same space and are, are uh, event professionals together, I'm really excited that you're able to step in and fill in. I'm, I'm looking forward to the conversation with you for sure. Yeah, I agree. I think this is going to be dynamic and fun, and I'm sure that I'm going to learn a thing or two. <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, so today's event is brought to you by Metro Collective and Startup Grind Rochester. Metro Collective is a collaborative network of people, ideas, and shared space communities in upstate New York. And Startup Grind is a global community for startups and entrepreneurs to address the growing challenges of launching a company. Special thanks today to Michael Thaney of Startup Grind for his support of today's event. Um, and Michael, you've been great to, to work with and pulling this all together, so. For sure. Yeah. Um, I want to remind everybody who is here today that this is a collaborative discussion, so please use the chat to ask questions throughout the event. And Travis and I are both going to be watching the chat while we're chatting live together. So we'll try to ask, your, ask and answer your questions in real time. Um, and I'm going to give you just a little bit of background on Travis before we jump into today's content. So Travis is a 15-year event technology professional. He's currently the president and CEO of GTR Event Technology and is an experienced sales-driven leader with a integrated history of growing event technology companies through targeted verticals and focused consultative sales strategies. That's a mouthful, Travis. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I can't say I wrote that. Yeah, it is a mouthful. <laughs> he's, a, he's a team-oriented leader, creating a culture where kind, results-driven individuals are empowered, tra trained, encouraged, and motivated to create remarkable experiences, which is what we all aim for with our events, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. Is uh, is is making impactful events at the end of the day is really our goal, and, and using technology to assist uh, event planners like yourself to to make that impact and uh, and fulfill those objectives, whatever they might be. Yep, absolutely. I'll just give people a little context um, as Travis is mentioning me as an event planner in my role as the president and CEO of Upstate Capital. Our mission is to create is to connect capital providers with companies that are seeking funding, primarily through events, because you know, business is built on relationships and mm -hmm. you form relationships and to solidify and sustain them by having primarily face-to-face -face contact as much as possible. So that's what we've been doing since 2003. Yeah. Um, great. So Travis, um, I'd love to uh, start off by talking just a little bit what, it, what it's been like for you running a company, running your company during COVID. <laughs> uh, great, great question. Uh, you know, I think I think the answer is probably similar to what most people would say that's been running a company through COVID. It's it's been challenging, right? Um, it's been difficult. I know our industry in particular, um, everything changed, right? Uh, we we everything we had done previously from face to face meetings um, and and getting people together and having that networking experience and uh, being able to to facilitate um, you know meetings person to person changed. Uh, we couldn't do it, right? Uh, and so we had to shift and shift how we did meetings, uh, how we still fulfilled the objectives of getting people together who um, who, who need to do business together, um, getting people to experience exhibitors and, 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 you know, see the product, new products and new innovation out there, training sales staff, all of the reasons that we have meetings and we get people together, um, it all changed. It all changed for us in particular. Um, you know, pre-COVID, we were um, we were a piece of the event, right? So we did the registration piece, or we did it, the event badges, or attendance tracking, or you know all these different components that were a part are, are a part of the broader event. Uh, during COVID, being a virtual event provider, we became all of that in one fell swoop. We became the venue, right? The hotel that it was, the the meeting was being run through. We became the registration and all the other components. Um, which is a big shift for us, and a big shift for the industry. And frankly, I think from a technology standpoint, we weren't ready for it. Uh, and, and things were difficult to get our feet under us. And uh, it was challenging for, for event planners and event organizers to wrap their head around how to, how to still do business uh, and, and have events that impact attendees and impact uh, individuals who are coming um, in, in this new world, right? Um, but we shifted quickly. Thankfully, at, at, at GTR, we have I've got an amazingly talented team, um, and we we got together really early on, and, and we saw this coming very early on. I think probably earlier than most, we were talking about the pandemic and how it was going to affect the industry in early February. 
um, and we just kind of saw things coming. We uh, we got in a room, we took all the data we had, and we moved and we shifted. We moved quickly in, in, in the direction, and we're able to, you know, knowing event, knowing technology like we do, and knowing events like we do, um, we knew we could move quickly into what we thought was coming, and we made that decision. We uh, we met together every week, and you know, once you make a decision, decisions aren't final, right? Uh, and so you can come in, you could adjust, and we we would course correct uh, every week and say, okay, we need to do this now, we need to do this now. Um, based on demand and based on what we were seeing, and um, you know, we really thankfully thrived through through COVID for the most part, um, and we're able to grow and able to to grow our our client base. We were able to provide solutions uh, and services and products for for our clients that others weren't, um, and and really you know help the industry through this, which is really our goal at the end of the day from a technology standpoint. You know, we've been around GTRs been around about 25 years. You stick around because you're you, you've got relationships and because you care about the people in the industry. Uh, and that's really what we did. Um, and, and you know, hats off to the team. We did well through it and have, have grown through it. So, but we can't say it was easy, right? Just like everybody else, it was a challenge. Yeah, yeah. I'm wondering, did you beat your projections when you looked sort of year over year? Where you we sure you did. Were? Yeah, we sure did, awesome. which is awesome. which is crazy. And that that includes having about a, a 60 day period where we didn't have much revenue coming in, in at all. You know, that, that kind of late February, March period, even early April, events weren't happening because everyone was like, okay, what are we doing? And, and then with the pandemic as it was, you know, we all thought by the 4th of July, everything's going to be back to normal. Right. Uh, and so it didn't happen. Uh, and, and it made for a really crazy fall and, 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 you know, end of the year. Um, but it was, you know, it was challenging. What, what about on, on your end, you know, leading it from an event, what, what, what shifts, what things did you have to do? You know, how is it from your perspective where you've got all these in-person events and you had to make that switch? Yeah, well, similar to you, we saw it coming early. We were talking about it um, internally. We were talking about it with our board of directors. We did actually host an event on March 12th, which was literally the last day. It was a Thursday, and they closed down the state of New York on Sunday. So it was literally the last day you could actually hold a, you know, a professional event. And it, you know, funnily enough, we had a guy who was an economic forecaster as our our speaker. Um, and he was saying, well, COVID's coming and this is going to be a crazy ride. So, uh, of course, that that is how it's happened. But as an organization, we pivoted early. We doubled down on delivering really exceptional content and we doubled down on technology to enable one on one networking. Yeah. And because I knew that the, our core value proposition as a net as an organization is that we provide networking opportunities, um, but you don't attract people to networking opportunities without great content. So we paired those two. We did a little experimentation to, to validate that thesis and, and it is accurate. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so we've actually been able to grow our membership and grow our event attendance because we now are able to reach people outside of upstate New York and nobody has to travel to Syracuse and Rochester and Buffalo to actually look at startups and to, to network with the private equity community. So it's actually overall been a positive for us. No, that's great. And I'm excited to hear that because I think, you know, early on in the in the pandemic, one of the things that we experienced with our clients were the, the question that they were asking was, how do I take my in-person event and make it virtual? Which is the wrong question, right? The question is like, how do I deliver the objectives that this meeting needs to have virtually, right? It's a it's a, it's a similar question, but it's, a, it's an entire change of focus. It and is. so many event organizers just tried to take their meeting and make it virtual. And it, it was unsuccessful, which is really sad because those are the people now saying, well, I'm never doing virtual again, um, when it could be such a great tool in your arsenal now. Um, the success, the really successful ones, they 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 did exactly as you guys did. So kudos and hats off. It's, just, it's, it's that saying, okay, what are our objectives? How do we use this new tool to get there and to still, to still fulfill that? And that's the right, it's interesting. That's where we find ourselves right now today too, right? With hybrid. Uh, it's not about how it, it's not about how do I create these two things and bring them together. It's okay. I've got this entire new thing. So how do I have, how do I achieve my objectives in a hybrid world where I've got virtual attendees, I've got in-person attendees, I got to bring them together somehow. Um, and it's 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 a little it's a little nuanced, but it's it's the right question. Uh, and, yeah, you know, I, I think you're exactly right, and I like the way you're phrasing it. Um, I think of it as you know you you're saying how do you accomplish your objectives. I think of it as how do I deliver the value. Yeah. How, do I, how do I deliver the value proposition that I promise? And what does that experience look like if you're sitting in your house? And what does that look like if you're standing in the venue that we're hosting? Yeah. You're absolutely right. We're, really we're absolutely not ever going to have events. You know, it'll be very rare for us to have an in-person 
only unless it's you know a small networking dinner that's on purpose set up that way but mostly most of our events will will never look like they looked you know a couple yeah. years ago. which which is exciting right i mean i think that's that's exciting um and, and for those event planners out there that aren't feeling that way it's, my hope is that you can hit reset because I, I know especially early on and i mentioned technology failing us and it really kind of hurt for a little bit there because we just weren't ready for it as an industry speaking about the technology side of our industry right we we didn't know and we had so many uh so many uh different companies pivoting their technology to try to make it all work um so there's a lot of bad experiences out there but really i think now there's a lot of really great experiences out there and, and having that augment uh, augmented side of your of your events and being able to allow um, i can't tell you how many times i heard attendees say Oh, I never got to go to the annual meeting because it was always overlapping with this, you know, my kid's birthday or whatever it was that they didn't want to miss. But virtually I could attend the whole thing. Right. Um, and 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 broadening your audience in that way is is uh, is so valuable. And it's as you mentioned, your organization has grown um, through this because you've you've been able to meet people where they are, not necessarily having them come to you. Right. Right. That's exactly right. I, I'm really curious just because you're so deep into the space and on the technology side. What cool things have you seen uh, people do, or what are you doing, you know, in your own company that's really sort of making that experience from a, a virtual or online uh, experience awesome? Yeah, um, I guess there's there's two parts to that question I, that I'll answer. So um, I, I think from a technology standpoint, our industry has always been late adopters, right? Um, I think you know I think most people would agree. We're, we typically uh, we typically bring things on after they've gone men, mainstream, you know, um, apps were on cell phones for a long time. By the time app, event apps came out, you know, um, everybody knew what an app was. It was kind of a late thing. And, and then it took, you know, gosh, what, five, six, seven years for that really to permeate the market where you expected when you went to an event to have an event app. Right. Um, uh, and so it, it's, it's been, we've been late adopters. What I'm excited about in this time, time period is, uh, is two things. One, I think, uh, event organizers see technology as a major part of their event and how they can leverage that to uh, to provide that value you were talking about, which is really exciting. The second piece is there has been more funding uh, in our space than has ever been before. Um, and uh, investors see this as a real market where they can put capital and get a return, which is really exciting because that just means innovation is really going to happen. I mean, you know, today I saw one of the one of the big uh, virtual providers meeting play raised 75 million dollars you know hopin came became you know pre-pandemic three employees you know working in a garage to the largest event technology company on earth you know through the pandemic um and so there's there's so much uh it's such an exciting time to be in my seat uh because innovation is going to come and it's such an exciting time um you know to be to be a meeting player that can that can adopt those things and bring partners in that can help them uh, adopt different pieces um, and hopefully it isn't, you know, hopefully we've, we've gotten past being the late adopters and can really, you know, grab onto things quickly and, and bring them into our arsenal and use them um, in this point in time. But there's a lot of really cool things I've seen uh, and, and heard from from a hybrid experience, you know, merging the hybrid and the virtual. Um, you know, I was talking to an event organizer uh, just last week and they, you know, little things like the chat uh, on, on the, you know, on, on the virtual event. If you've done a virtual event, you're watching the session, you typically have a chat on the side like we do for this meeting here. Um, they're going to have an entire chat wall. So the left side of their stage is going to be that chat conversation. So I could be in person seeing the chat messages that virtual attendees are saying and then also contribute to that conversation. Um, and so it's, it's one easy way to bring that cohesive experience uh, together. Um, you know, I think uh, MPI has done it really well um, where, you know, they have outside of the exhibit hall, they've got their like sports caster desk type thing where they've got, they've got always, always got people popping in that they're interviewing and it uh, from a virtual perspective, it adds that additional element of um, bringing that cohesive experience uh, together. Um, lots of cool innovation in, in terms of things like that, that are, that are coming through. Uh, and then again, you know, thinking about it differently um, and knowing that your virtual experience isn't going to be your in-person experience. In-person has got a, a feel that you can't replicate. Um, you know, right. funny, early on talking to exhibitors, one of the biggest challenges we had was, was exhibitors feeling like they got the value from a virtual event because, you know, you talk to them and they say, well, you know, in the expo hall, in person, there's just there's so much buzz and there's so much activity and there's so much, you know, people always walking by. And I, I get it in, in, in a virtual world. Typically you're sitting, you know, kind of in a virtual room alone until somebody pops in and you don't get that feeling of excitement. 
Um, and so it's changing the perception. And that was a conversation we would have with our clients and, and then through to our, our exhibitors. It's like, you have to change your perception that, you know, what is the value you're getting out of this? You're looking for leads. If you look at, if you look at the lead quantity you would get from an in-person event, uh, the, the overall value you would get would be pretty even and comparable. You just wouldn't have, you know, 700 people dropping their business card into a fishbowl because they want an iPad, but you would get 12 actionable leads who really were interested in your product. Uh, yes. So it's kind of shifting those expectations um, and, and, and preparing people differently. Um, I don't know why I went on that tangent, but there I went. Um, no, I think that's the question you, you gave me there, but. Yeah, I think that's actually a great, it's, it's a super important topic, right? Especially for people like me who, I, you know, I rely on monetizing sponsorship for events to support our annual operating budget uh, at Upstate Capital. Yeah. And so understanding how to, to use the technology in new and different ways and then how to communicate that value proposition to sponsors um, I think is really important. Um, yeah, and, and there were way, there's ways to do it that are so valuable. You know, in an in-person event, to be able to tell you every person that walked by your booth or stood in your, in your booth, you have to deploy some pretty expensive technology typically. In a virtual world, I can tell you that, you know, I, I, in real time, I can tell you there's 15 people on your page right now that are looking at it. There are this many people who've clicked through and done this, and you get that engagement. I can tell you who they are, right? You know, I can tell you, you know, Noah stopped by your booth 11 times. You know, maybe you should reach out and see what she's interested in. Um, yeah. that's a, that's a, that's a value you're not going to get in person unless you've got some, somebody that with a, you know, that, that can memorize faces and say, you've been here 11 times. What do you, you know, but, um, mm -hmm. but you can get that in virtual, which is just a different value proposition than, than in person. Um, yeah. I think that's a really, uh, a really important point. Um, qualified leads, you know, quality over quantity, right? <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. And it's, it, but it's difficult. That was a shift. That's a, and another was a shift in mindset where, um, you know, how many of those leads, you know, you got 700 leads, but that was just people trying to get an iPad. Um, and how many of them were really quality? And you can get that um, in, in a virtual experience or in a hybrid experience, you know, from an exhibitor standpoint, I'd want to be in both places. Um, right. And I would have different people working different strategies in, in both of those locations yep. um, because it's not the same. You have to work a little bit harder in the virtual. You've got to go after them. You've got to schedule meetings. You've got to find people that you'd like to connect with. Um, you've got to track, you know, people visiting your booth and, and proactively engage with them and you'll get great results. And then in person, it's, it's pretty, it's, it's very similar. You know, you see a lot of times, you know, the, the booths that the people that just sit back at their booth and wait for people to come versus the people going out and getting and engaging people. Um, mm -hmm. But different strategies. And I, I, I want to be in both places. Yeah, I think I agree. I agree. And I think just the efficiency of having highly qualified leads yeah. um, and, when you set yourself up in the right event as a, an event attendee or as an event sponsor in the target rich environment that you want to be in, and then you can sort of shoot fish in a barrel. I mean, <laughs> that's exactly right. 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 And it, you're right that it takes being proactive. It takes thinking about what you're doing differently. Um, this is not like going to a trade show and yeah. standing in exhibit hall. Which again, the challenging part for that is it's just more work on your part, right? You as the event planner, the event organizer, you've almost got to retrain you know, your, your exhibitors and sponsors, like, you know, look at value this way and understand that this is going to be significant. Um, but these are the behaviors you now have to engage in to get there, um, right. which are different. Um, and it's, it, it's just challenging. And again, that's where early on that was, we didn't, no one knew. Right. Uh, and so you had to go through a couple of cycles of figuring that out and then say, okay, this is how we can get value out of this. Um, yeah. so. I'm interested to see in the future, sort of as we, you know, evolve into this fully high, fully committed on the hybrid model for our larger events, um, how we monetize differently, in terms of, you know, as a the person who has the PL responsibility, yeah. you know, how do we monetize differently between virtual and in person, and how do we then overhaul communications to to drive the the behaviors that we want and and to create the right value propositions for the, the people that and the organizations that support. What's, what's exciting about that model is, is in a hybrid, you're going to get more data than you know what to do with. When I think about innovation in, in our industry for the next 10 years, what excites me mm -hmm. is data. Data is going to become huge. Um, and, and I'm not necessarily like saying scary big brother data. I'm saying the, the ability to, to know, you know, in an in-person event, let's say I sit down and I, I join a session. Um, it's gotta be pretty bad for me to get up and make the statement of walking out like I don't like it, especially if other people have gotten up and walked out. Um, you know, I might sit there, I might just bring out my phone and I might do that. In, an, in, a, in a virtual, 
I'm just going to click off and go somewhere else, right? And so you can start to see not just survey results, but how are speakers resonating and which ones are really getting engagement and which ones and and, and what topics, you know, oftentimes, uh, you know, you might think that the industry is trending this way, but being able to really see the value of like, no, people are attending these types of sessions. We need to double down on these types of sessions that are that engage in these topics, whatever it might be for your specific industry or meeting um, and, and have that value. Um, and then getting, you know, all the way down to the nitty gritty of meeting planning. You know, once once you understand and, and are able to pull in all different types of data, you can say, OK, what, what would be the impact of, you know, we've always had our meeting in the southeast. What would be the impact of doing it in the northeast or in the west coast? And data will be able to tell you, oh, well, you know what, based on, you know, air flight PNR records and the cost of traveling from here and the demographic of where your attendees come from, if you put your event in Texas, your might your attendance looks like it would go up by about 15 percent or whatever those might be and a data can help make them drive those decisions where you're not on an island just going well let's go to dallas right um, yeah you can actually make an educated decision and say well this data is telling us that, that we'll get 15 percent more people because the, the cost barrier is less or whatever that might be right um i'm excited for that that's where gtr is really headed and where we're focusing a lot of our efforts is is not just getting data because there's always been a lot of data in events but yeah interpreting data is very difficult and giving it to a to a meeting plan and saying here's here's something that you can act on actionable data is is complicated and hard and so we're really working hard on all of those different elements you know you know to, to kind of redefine engagement what does that mean for an attendee how can you really quantify that in a way that is much broader you know how can you see what exhibitors are, are really resonating and 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 you know what speakers are resonating where your meeting should go and and, and giving that as an actionable items to to event organizers. So that's kind of our big focus uh, over the next decade, really. Wow. Yeah, I think that's very interesting in terms of the value proposition to event planners just for the the location alone. Uh, right. I find that really interesting. One of the things you said earlier was around, um, you know, sort of off the cuff data, we can always get a survey results. And I know there's some element of, of tactical um, you know, tactical action items for event planners that we're hoping to drive out of here. And one of them I want personally is how, what are there tricks that you know to get people to do surveys? Like what kinds of things do you see work in terms of driving response rates for surveys? Yeah, um, I, I would say the most successful are, are like our continuing education clients. You tie it to actually getting your certificate. You don't get your certificate until you mm -hmm. fill, fill out the survey, right? That's really successful. The other things that are really big is is speed, is getting, getting to them while it's fresh. Um, so, you know, having people outside of session halls with iPads, you know, saying, hey, would you take a quick survey? Um, you know, that really drives a lot of that, uh, that survey engagement. Mm -hmm. um, it, again, it takes extra effort, but in a lot of events, there's always volunteers who want to be a part of it and getting them out there, sure. having them do those kinds of things would be valuable. Um, but speed is typically one of the most important pieces. The longer somebody waits, uh, the less likely they are. Engaging them where they live, right? So. Um, you know, here, not just in, in the app, but via text message, you know, hey, I saw you were in XYZ session, uh, click here to take the quick survey. Um, you're going to see a lot and get a, a much higher rate of engagement through through those types of initiatives as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, I'm, I'm always a big proponent of how you set up your survey, right? Uh, setting it up to where it's, you know, it's if you, if you want to ask five or six or seven questions, doing so in small bite sized chunks versus one long document, you know, where it's like, I, feel, I answer two questions and then I hit next and I answer two more. And then by the time I'm two pages in, I, I, you know, psychologically, I'm like, I'm already invested in this. So I'll take, you know, I'll, I'll answer the next two questions for a six question survey. Um, yeah. But setting up those questions are, are setting up those, how you set up your survey is really valuable too. Yeah. Um, that makes sense. You don't want to intimidate people and not too many yeah. open response questions, even though often those are, those comments are really helpful. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, those are those are some good points. I think we haven't tried anything like survey via text, um, and we yeah. have push out. So uh, we've had the call to action during the programs, especially online, and we have it right there in the yeah. not. Um, what about incentivizing surveys with prizes or with? That's always a good make it part of the game, right? If you have it on, if you've if you got a you know an expo hall and you've got the scavenger hunt, everyone does make surveys part of that game as well and award points. That always works. For, for a group of people, right, um, that, that engage in those. You've got the group of people who are diehards that, that get into it, yeah. and the group of people who don't, right, uh, and don't right. care. Um, the other thing that I found really successful is is showing the value of those surveys. So like, you know, during the next session talking about, 
you know, hey, we got a comment from so and so that said X, Y, and Z, and we love that feedback. Thank you so much. And then everybody, you know, it, it kind of reinforces the value of like we hear you, um, yeah. and not just as going in a vault and we'll use this to plan the next meeting, right? Um, right. But but using those kinds of things has always been really helpful as well. Yeah. Uh, the game I, is a tricky one. I'll just mention this too. The game is a tricky one. You got to set it up right because if you set it up incorrectly and all of a sudden somebody jumps out to a, what even is perceived as a huge lead, your your adoption rate on the game drops significantly, right? So mm -hmm. um, if somebody looks like they're 60,000 points ahead, um, even though maybe you're awarding things on 10,000 point intervals, mentally I'm, I'm checked out. I'm saying, okay, well, the game's already won. You know, mm -hmm. Bob's got the game wrapped up. Um, so, so thinking about how you're awarding those points is going to be a big deal uh, to make sure that you keep things. The perception is that it's really still a tight race and you're right there, even if you're not. <laughs> um, right. And so I guess you probably avoid avoid that by not allowing too many points for any one activity. Yeah, exactly. Or, or low point values. Right. So instead of awarding things by hundreds, award them by ones and twos. You know, um, I'm a big proponent of like, especially the expo hall, you can you can upsell the game and say, hey, you're. For the premium package, your your booth is five points, right? Um, yep. And everybody else is one point. Uh, and so there's that extra incentive, like I get five points by visiting GTR's booth. I'm headed there right now. Yeah, um, right, right. Which then runs the risk of maybe your leads aren't as high quality. Yeah, which again, I always say too, and and, and you know, game, you know, the, the game piece too. If you're if you're doing it with exhibitors, um, the value is getting the exhibitors to be able to give their pitch. And so oftentimes, what I would tell what I tell our clients is build your game to where the answer the answer to the question that is about that exhibitor is in the pitch that that the exhibitor is going to give it's not just walk by and scan a code on their table um, because really there's no transfer of value to the okay. exhibitor um, they just see people walk through and say where's your barcode i can scan but right. if i have to actually sit there and listen to your five minute elevator you know your elevator mm -hmm. pitch or even your five minute you know and that's where i'm going to get the answer to the question um, that's where there's a ton of value that value transfer Mm, yeah, yeah. Interesting. I, I think that's an interesting point and something that we played around with a little bit with trying to make sure that the word or a phrase gets out in a keynote speaker. Yeah. To, so we know people are going to watch the. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it's the same concept. And I, I think that's really smart. Um, I wonder, from a technology standpoint, are there, you, you talked about data being big piece of, um, of what you're focused on in the future. Are there other key pieces that you adopted quickly over this last year that you're seeing a lot of success with? Or that um, implemented? Yeah, um, over the past year, I mean, everything is new. That's what's difficult about that question because the whole video medium is new. Um, I think you know one of, the, one of the ways that I would advise someone is when they're looking at technology to, to adopt, um, t take your time uh, and really um, interview a lot of different, uh, both, you know, tap into your planner network and, and, and you ask a lot of questions there, uh, and then meet with a lot of different organizations, a lot of di different event technology planners, figure out what it is that you need as well. Cause they're all different, right? You've got some event technology companies that like, we're hundred percent SaaS. You're going to sign up and you're going to get a username and a password. And we're going to point you at YouTube videos. And if you need help, you know, good luck. Right. And so yeah. knowing those things, and maybe that's what you need because you know, you've got, you know, Jane on your team and Jane is a technology whiz and she'll figure this out and get through it and that's all that you need but but if you're if you're you know especially as we come into this new world where hybrid is a real thing and it's really an event within an event right and it's going to take additional resources and additional time and additional people uh, somebody's going to have to do that work so if it's not on your team it's finding those partners who are going to be able to step in and help do a lot of those things too and some of it not every event technology company is e is e equal right so doing your due diligence and figuring out what are the pieces that I need that are important for me to achieve, achieve uh, that value and those objectives um, is what's really, really going to be key. Uh, and, you know, not every platform is the same, you know, as you, as you well know, you know, some of them do networking incredibly well. Others, it's all about delivering content in a, in a way that kind of wows and, and makes it feel, you know, uh, and so do your due diligence, figure it out, really study hard, really get out, get after it and figure out what, what's going to work for your group and your event. Um, and that might be different event to event too. Um, you know, not being afraid to say, you know, we've got a couple of different partners um, is valuable. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and similar to the way I think about things, I have particular, you know, we're having a big event where we want people to have some casual networking, that technology stack, especially if we're driving a lot of the hybrid, the virtual or the hybrid um, might not be the right one for one where mm -hmm. the networking is the key. 
the key focus and the connection and making high quality connections is the key focus. Yeah. That's another thing that I love about virtual that you can make people's lives so much more efficient. <laughs> Again, it's a, it's a behavior change, right? right. Um, on the part of the attendee. And that's actually, that's not that easy, <laughs> right? Yeah. Walk me through that. How, what are ways that you have done, that you guys have made it more efficient on, from an attendee perspective? Well, so different different technologies um, have different ways to categorize people within. You know, you can, you've been able to segment your audience mm -hmm. for a long time and say you're an investor, you're this, or you're that. As we leverage technology more, we can get more granular. And then, you know, there are, um, you know, in my fantasy world, if I, you know, was going to build my own app, I'd build a dating app. I'd, I'd make it look just like Match or Bumble or one. I don't actually know how they work, but <laughs> I'd build the algorithmic matchmaking, and I'd I'd have those faces, and it'd be a swipe left for, you know, a positive outcome and swipe right because you don't want to talk to them or, yeah, you know, what swiping is. But <laughs> yeah. you understand my point. I, yeah. I, you know, so if you if you're looking for something to build next to GTR, <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that's great. I think that's valuable. Again, that's. Well, you know, I, I think you would know, know this probably better than I, but the toughest thing in virtual has been to, to, to somehow recreate that networking piece to get people talking yep. together, get people meeting together. It's so, it's so easy in an in-person world to, you know, you're standing there getting, filling up coffee with somebody and asking somebody who they're, you know, Hey, Hey, Bob, look at their name tag. You know, who are, tell me about yourself. Tell me about, right. you know, upstate capital, right. Um, in, in, in a, in a virtual world, it's like, you just, you put two people together and they're going to be on screen together and it's a little awkward introductions and, and trying to facilitate that. It's a different experience. So, um, but those, but again, I, to your point, those algorithms that can help guarantee that the person I'm going to meet with, um, you know, both has interest in me and I have interest in them because of what, what, what we're trying to achieve here at this meeting. Um, that, that, that'd be huge. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's super valuable. Um, and I think that's not exclusive. You know, I, a lot of people like to come to upstate capital events because they know, a lot of the right people are going to be in the room, but they're also, you know, it's also still not that efficient, right? If you've got some early stage angel investors, but you really want to meet a private equity investor, no. you know, you've got to, you got to sort the wheat from the chaff then. And, and it's not efficient in an organic process. Right. <laughs> so, you know, I think even in, in person, being able to, to create value with technology to make that time in person more efficient is helpful, but you're right. The organic networking still has to happen. you People still want that. They're used to it. They and and so setting up the place for that to happen is is uh, helpful. We've we've done it where we set up tables and then you know I'm going to host a table and so if you want to come talk to me and you want me to tell you who you should talk to then you can do that and I'll just yeah. be there for half an hour or sit there for half an hour and and do that kind of pairing off of people. That's that's a great idea though. That, that that's a good because you know when when someone like you has has value into all of those different people and say oh you should really meet with so and so. Yeah. Um, getting an opportunity for you to be in a central place where everybody could come and say, you know, even describe I'm trying to do this and you're like oh you know what so and so was just here saying they want the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So idea. thanks. Um, <laughs> I I try to make it useful, but also I'm not scalable, right? Right. I, I'm only one person. That's one brain, and I don't yeah. know how to put that into a digital map yet. <laughs> yeah, that's very true. You know. Yeah. Um, but that that is something that has been helpful for our group. The other thing that I have done that actually has been wildly popular is taken a subset of the attendees and said, we're going to have a subset group roundtable discussion, and that's going to come before the event happens. And so we've been doing CEO roundtables for these startups who are pitching at our events. And so we get actually on a totally separate, we just get on a Zoom call. I host or I co-host with a partner a conversation that is organic in nature and is capped at, you know, 10 or 12 or 15 or 20 people. Yeah. And then those, those people then are watching each other's pitches, you know, a couple hours later, and then they're in networking areas together and they, it makes everybody a little bit more comfortable, um, more connected. And then there's longer term value for them in those small group discussions. Yeah, that's a great idea too. I mean, you're building that community early, right? Um, and having that tribe kind of get together early that can then spread that out throughout. And that's that's a really great idea as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, I love that. It's really, yeah. that's, those are really practical tips. Uh, I think those are great. Some of the things that people can implement quickly. Yeah, right. It doesn't take, that doesn't take much. Right. <laughs> um, and if you have a few different people who you know are good at managing conversations and letting things happen organically and, you know, shutting people down who talk too much. <laughs> All of those skills. If yeah. can that well, then you can run those sessions, and you can cherry pick and and 
you know, thoughtfully curate that group to to make it valuable for them. Yeah, I think that's a great tip just for those those type of meeting style sessions in general is um, you can't throw 15 people, 20 people in a room together and not have somebody that is kind of charismatic that's leading leading them all and starting the dialogue. I've seen that happen a lot of times and those meetings kind of fall flat. Um, whereas when you have the person in there who's 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 got kind of the, the the abbreviated agenda that can drive conversation, that can do all those things, those are really, really valuable. Yeah, I agree. And I think developing that skill set with you know, building that skill set on your team so yeah. that you have multiple people makes that piece of it a little bit more scalable because it's not a heavy time lift. Yeah. If you can get people who can have those skills, do that. You can have three or four of them, and you know, then you've engaged fifty people instead of ten. Yeah, I've seen that happen. Where that's a really good, um, and you have to do this carefully with the right people. And you would know, you would know because you know, you would know your your organization. But I've seen that really work well with sponsors, where you let sponsors be that person. Uh, you tell them, hey, you know, Sue, you've got the first thirty seconds to introduce yourself and who you are. But this isn't about you. This is about you facilitating this this conversation. Um, that is another one of those drivers of value for those people that they're like, oh man, I'm getting to meet all of these people, and you know, and then and then I can network with them afterwards, and and that's when I can start, you know, hey, you were you, you had this problem that you talked about, you know, our product solves that, and this is how, right? So that's one of the areas I've seen that too. You have to do it with the right people because you get some of those some of them are just too salesy and they they can't shut that off, um, but it, it could be a really good value. I've seen I've seen that done really successfully. Well, I think. You know, just to that point, I was actually able to sign a large, significant annual sponsor on this basis of the invitation to co-host this these events with yeah. these deals with me. So, I, you know, you're absolutely right. <laughs> you, but you want to make sure you know that person well, and yeah. you're not going to talk too much. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, that's a great point. Um, I wonder if there are mistakes that you see event planners make. You know, I know you talked a little bit about. Uh, well, just now of not making sure you have somebody who can manage a group conversation, um, maybe not doing a great job on the content side. I'm wondering if there are other things that you know come to mind when you think about, oh, that's a definite no. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, I think I think the vast majority of event event planning is hard, right? Uh, and it's that's a that's a tough job, and so many of them absolutely crush it and do great jobs. Um, where I typically see event planners make mistakes or fail, um, uh, you know both in person and virtual, they plan the meeting that they want to attend, right? Um, and that's right. often a demographic miss or a psychographic miss, miss which is even more important, right? Um, right? And so the successful event planners plan the event that is going to provide the value for their attendees. You know, I, I think when I'm often wowed by events, it's not necessarily by, um, you know, some really cool technology thing. I mean, you'd think that would be what I'd go after, but it's really about, you know, I remember attending early, late in, in 2019, a, a big data conference with a bunch of computer, you know, geeks and nerds and things like that. And um, the event planner planned the entire meeting around that psychographic, you know, instead of having, you know, cocktail hour um, where these people have to go around and try to mingle, which isn't typically that demographic. They set up arcade games, right? Multiplayer arcade games everywhere. Um, really small tables where it's going to be just a handful of people versus big eight, top, eight, eight or 10 top tables. Um, and created an environment where that type of person is going to get engaged, be engaged in, in a safe setting where they feel safe, where they feel. And I remember standing in that room going, this may be the most successful kind of cocktail networking hour I've ever seen. Yeah. Um, because they thought of every little detail that that demographic uh, and psychographic uh, would use. Right. Um, yeah. And uh, it was completely contrary to the event planner. She was a bubbly, you know, socialite and all of those kinds of things you know and i've seen i remember seeing the same thing in in, in sales um you know different sales uh, you know um events and things like that where you, you build some competition into it and you do different things like that um so that's that's i think doing it right doing it wrong is doing the opposite building the event that you want to attend or, or not taking those into account or building the one that you went to and just thought that was cool and i'm just going to implement that um and it flops because it's you know Again, those big data guys don't want to put on those headphones and then no one else hears the music and do the dance. You know, you've seen those things where they dance. You know, it's not going to it's not going to work for that demographic. Um, typically, I mean that you know maybe later on in the evening after the bars are open for a while. But, <laughs> but um, that's that's one of the big mistakes. Um, uh, I think I think the other mistake one I'm one I'm really nervous about right now is um, you know event planning is is difficult and. Uh, I think a, what I've what, what I've seen right now is that a lot of event planners, 
have lost help, right? So they've had a furlough or lay people off because they just didn't have the budget they, they once had. Uh, and as events come back, uh, it's only gotten more complicated if you're going to try to do hybrid. So being understaffed is really going to be scary um, because, you know, you're just going to have so much on your shoulders. Um, so if that's if that's you as an event planner, um, pulling in partners, figuring out how you can maybe if you're if your uh, stakeholders are saying we're not going to hire a full time employee, figuring out ways that you could augment your staff with partners, augment your staff in yeah. different ways, um, share the load in, in every way that you possibly can, because it's it is a far more complex plan um, if you're going to be doing a hybrid event uh, or something like that. And so um, not having enough help, uh, and I've seen that time and time again, um, you know, even on the virtual standpoint where a single event planner was trying to plan a, you know, five or 10,000 person event, and it's just, you know, they're putting in 200 hour weeks and just burning out, you know, before the events even happened. And, um, and so that makes me nervous. Um, the other the other mistake I see a lot of event planners make is just ignoring data. Um, you know, not not asking questions of your technology partner or where the data is coming from, like, hey, how are other organizers using this? Um, what are ways that I can share sh show value to my uh, to my stakeholders, right? From from a data perspective, um, what are what are other things that I should be doing with with data? Or how should I be collecting data that that I'm not right now? Mm -hmm. um, you know, all of those kinds of things are, are, are I think often mistakes that I, I I see made. Yep, I think those are really great points, and there's some nuance, right? Because different events, different stakeholders, different you know yeah, different needs. Entirely but, different. Uh, but I think those are those are great points for as a place for people to start. Um, I you know I think we're uh, we've got time if people have questions. I feel like this has been a great conversation. <laughs> I've learned um, a lot already. Yeah. Yeah. What what, what about you? What, what from a mistake standpoint? Um, what are some that you you've made that you were like, oh, that didn't work out so well, or what are some that you've seen or that you're worried um, about? Well, so just in this last year, I definitely flopped a little bit with just trying to put on networking events for our members just saying there's no content we're just going to have a you know lunch hour join in here that you know is not compelling for people so we didn't get great attendance um so I, I think you know i think that's that's a that was one learning that i had just make sure you have good compelling content for somebody yeah. <laughs> where it's interesting for us when i think about what is our psychographic what is our demographic because we have investors we have entrepreneurs we have angel investors, we have private equity investors. And so, you know, creating a, a value proposition for each of these audiences and making sure we're communicating that effectively. Um, you know, I think there's a learning curve, right? Yeah. Um, there's a learning curve. And then butting up against that learning curve is, you know, if we're talking to our members all the time, talking to our email lists all the time, um, making sure those messages aren't getting stale. So so how are we sort of and and it's once you're deep in the middle of something it's really hard to think outside of the box <laughs> that you built right <laughs> and so so i think i could do a better job of engaging people knowledgeable people outside of the organization to help stimulate the creativity to help um you know because the one thing you can count on is change right the one thing exactly. that's constant is change and so if you embrace that as a you're ethos and you're not trying to do the same thing over and over again to your point of just create the event you just attended or you thought was cool um but you're embracing change and you're you're um thinking about uh how change can happen how it can work for you i think it's a good mindset to use to approach especially going into this next year of of hybrid events yeah no i i i agree completely and i'm really excited about that for the event organizers that see it right this is a cool opportunity for you to to take that step back because as you mentioned getting when you're in the middle of it you're doing the same events year after year after year you just you kind of are on rinse and repeat right um and, and it's a great moment in time for you to reevaluate that right now step back and say okay well, what are we doing that's really working and when you and, and it's challenging because you have to take every one of those attendee types of those types of people coming into an account and say what is what do they want out of this Right. Um, you know, what is it that they need to to have, feel, data, connections they need to have made, and then you've got to figure out ways to make all that happen. Um, but it's an awesome opportunity to, to figure that out again and to look back and say, how can we do this differently? Um, because I think I think event attendees expect it. Um, you know, I think they, they, they expect to have, to, to, to see something new and to have a new experience. And going back to the way you've always done the same exact event um, is probably going to be scary for, for, for you uh, as an event mm -hmm. organizer, because everyone else, the, the really great planners out there are saying, no, no, I'm reinventing our meeting right now. Yeah. And this right. is how our meeting is going to go for the next five years, you know, with, with different shifts here and there. Um, but it's really, uh, it's really a good moment in time to do that. 
Yeah, yeah, I think so too. Um, so if you do have a question here from Adam Briggs, uh, he says, great talk, first of all. So thank you, Travis. <laughs> One question for both of us. Do we see the current spike in inflation as being a long-term problem? And if so, what are we doing to prepare for increases in our operating expenses? Do you want to go first? You go first because you're, okay. on, you're, on you're on the event budget side of this. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, I will say that I do... Uh, like to manage risk. And I do see inflation as a risk. Um, I think that it will probably be managed. I don't think the federal government is going to let it get out of control uh, or the Federal Reserve. Uh, but I, you know, in the, in the off chance that that happens, I, one of the things I find really funny about the last year is that while our budget, uh, you know, we, we had a budget and we were about maybe nine or 10% below overall revenue, but we were up, up, up. On, on our profitability. And we're up on profitability because when you do online events, <laughs> you have a sunk cost in your software, but you're not renting space. You're not buying you know, food and alcohol and, and beverages. You're not traveling. You're not putting people up in hotels. So our, 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 our organization is more profitable with the, with the virtual model. Um, and so, I think that that's one piece of it. The second piece of it for me, the way I mitigate risk is through exactly what actually Travis was just talking about around partnerships. Where can I find opportunities to collaborate where people, you know, people and organizations are, are properly aligned with our objectives. And there are plenty of opportunities for that in my space in um, upstate New York, particularly, and really across New York. And so finding aligned partners, you know, managing, uh, sharing the load, I guess, sharing the, the expenses across those partnerships as much as we can. Um, and then, you know, I, I tend to be a pretty cost conscious, you know, I'm, I'm P&L focused because, if, you know, we, we have to be, we're a small organization. <laughs> so if I'm not keeping a watch on those numbers, it's, uh, you know, can get out of hand. And, and I, you know, I'm very careful about that. Yeah, no, those are those are really great points. I think um, when I think about kind of where we're at uh, from an economic standpoint, I think originally I, earlier on, I was thinking that we might see the same type of um, you know downward trend in virtual events as we saw the spike. Right. Um, but I think that's going to be a, a much more gradual decline because of, of the fear of inflation, because with virtual events, not only um, are the costs typically lower, but they're fixed costs traditionally. Right. You know exactly what it's going to be, whereas I go on site every gallon of coffee's cost me 558 bucks. And, you know, if people are really into the coffee, I, I mean, it's just my F and B is just going to continue to go you know, higher and higher and higher. And those are all those, those unknowns. I mean, I sat with, you know, event planner after event planner looking at VEOs going, geez, how did, you know, how does this continue to grow? Um, uh, and so with virtual, you can have that fixed cost. So I think those, those types of meetings, I think organizations are going to, are going to look closer at saying, okay, does this mean have to be in person? Right. Uh, you know, if no, then it, it could very well be and maintain and stay a virtual. I was talking to a corporate client of ours and they were saying they'll never have another sales meeting in person again. There's just no reason to. We can we can deliver on that learning objective virtually better than we can in person. Um, yeah. And so I think those are some of the things that 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 um, I think there was such pent up demand. Right. And that the buzzword now is like pent up demand versus, you know, social distancing of you know a year ago. Um, right for in-person, because I think human beings are naturally wanting that. They want to get back to seeing people again. Um, but I think that that this will be one of the drivers of, of, of slowing that in-person, every meeting is going back in-person, um, to, to keeping some that are going to stay virtual. Uh, it's going to be a, a gradual trend uh, trend downwards. Yeah. And there will be some meetings that never go back to in-person. Like I said, those that organization said their sales meetings are, will, will always be virtual moving forward. I get that. Yeah, absolutely. Makes sense. Uh, Michael asked a question. Uh, and said that during the pandemic, a lot of platforms tried to replicate physical event experience in digital. And did we observe any instances where a new technology created a new and better experience? Yeah, um, I don't remember the term of what that's called when you try to recreate a physical space, you know, and you have that like you you see fake people walking around and things like that. Uh, I was I was a big advocate against it um, because I I thought that you, you're setting an expectation for an attendee. Um, and you're setting the wrong one. You're setting that this is going to be similar than what you as what you've always experienced, and mm -hmm. you will never live up to that, right? Mm -hmm. um, you will never be able to achieve that buzz and that in-person feel. Um, and so, what I was left, what we were leveraging at GTR, and what we 
pr promoted to our clients was this is a new thing and it needs to be handled as a new thing. And I don't want it to look like a physical space here. I want it to look like a digital space intentionally. Let's make every button be, be intentional and every data point be intentional and everything is well thought out um, versus trying to replicate again, something that has been, that, that was a physical experience. I, I felt like those looked, um, I, I felt like they looked cheesy. The, you know, it looked like something out of the, the mid to late nineties for the most part. Um, and and it, it just set my, your mindset in the wrong, in the wrong space from an attendee perspective for this meeting. Uh, and, and you weren't going to be able to live up to it. Um, the best ones took what was a virtual platform, made it, made that the experience, made that intentional. Uh, and again, every little place within the virtual platform was was thought out, um, whether it be discussion boards or communities over here or this, that, or the other, um, was really better, uh, a better experience. What, what about, you know, did you have any interest in, in some of those other ones like that? Or did you see them or experience any of them? Um, I would say not particularly. I don't have a lot to add to to this side of the conversation. You know, I was already using some networking software before the pandemic happened that I thought was was interesting and good and I uh, and helpful as long as people were using it. But as you know, driving adoption, especially pre-COVID of technology, was not super easy. Out of necessity, people have, have done this more um, over the last 18 months. But I think uh, I agree with you that the virtual experience is, is distinct yeah. and trying to to mirror sort of an in-person experience is a little odd i do like that said i do like those um those networking rooms where you can see the people's heads moving around yeah so, so do i yeah, yeah yeah i think that's that's kind of cool because then you can go out and you can hover on their name and see who they are and yeah and you can chat with them or you can video chat with them and i think that's cool yeah i do like that as well but I, and i think that's different um, I, I early on when we were when we were trying to figure out what did we want to be, we looked at a bunch of the uh, the virtual platforms that were very avatar based. You know, and you pick your person, you build it out almost like a video game, and then you go walk around this this yeah. virtual world. And um, one, you know, building my own avatar just feels I don't know, maybe it's just I'm overly self conscious or whatever. But it's like I don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, but then I found myself, you know, I attended a couple of events with that, and I found myself skipping walking to the next, you know, walking to the other venue or doing something like that, and I would just click i found myself doing it through mouse clicks anyway um and kind of circumventing that entire experience there were some benefits to it you know the ability when proximity right so when you got right. within the distance um you know in your microphone and, cam and camera on you automatically connected and things like that that were perhaps there's something there um but uh i think overall it's, it's better to look at it as a distinct uh, an entirely distinct experience yep i agree all right i don't see any other questions coming up in the chat any sort of final thoughts you want to share Travis? Um, you know, I kind of I hit on a lot of them. Again, I hope I hope that uh, the industry is really excited about this moment in time. And I know that I, I say that having gone through the pandemic, too, and excitement is a difficult thing to drum up still, right? Because it's like, you know, we're all still like the pandemic took it out of a lot of us, you know, especially in this industry where, um, you know, we lost a lot of great colleagues. I mean, I can't tell you how many great, great colleagues I have that are selling real estate now, you know, and they may never come back. Right. Um, and, and so we lost great colleagues. We, we um, you know, we it was a challenging time for our industry um but i think there is this excitement uh about where we're where we find ourselves right now with all this capital coming into our our our, our industry um new innovations are going to be coming out left and right um honestly as i look at the event technology companies the really good people are the ones rising to the top too which is really exciting um you know just the people who really genuinely care and are not out to just get cash and get you know uh, but it's people who want to make change and affect change in the industry and do good things. And, you know, meetings and events are so, they're so powerful. It's, I love this industry because we need to get like-minded people together and they're going for a common objective or they're trying to solve big problems or they're trying to do big business. It's such a wonderful thing to watch, right? And we're in this cool moment in time where we can reinvent that, right? We can, you know, I'm, a, I'm in a big push right now of redefining engagement because I think the way that we talk about that word is so narrow uh, and for such a small demographic of people that it, it really, you know, we have the opportunity to go broader with those kinds of things. So looking at events from beginning to end and saying, what could we change? What could we do differently? How could we do it, do it differently? You know, we at GTR did that exact same thing with our product. We used COVID to reinvent our entire product line because the products that we had served in industry in a different era uh, and they were great. And we, we, we leveraged all of that experience and said, okay, what are, what are event planners going to need for the next 10 years? And we reinvented everything and we redid everything. 
Um, we use that. We use this opportunity to, to do that. Um, and, and I know there's a lot of organizations and a lot of companies that have done the same thing. And so, and, and so then event planners have new tools that they can leverage, um, and they can figure out new ways to 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 bring that value to to the people coming. Um, and I'm really, really, really excited about that. I think it's an awesome time in our industry uh, as things start, you know, coming back. And I think they'll come back quickly as they already kind of have. Um, and and uh, it, it'll for, for the right events, it'll change. It'll everything will have changed, and they'll they'll be they'll be doing new things that um, will really excite both the virtual attendee and the in-person attendee. Yeah, yeah, I think those are all really great points. And I'm congratulations to you for really taking the opportunity that COVID presented to really rethink your long-term plan. I think that's that's brilliant and really excellent leadership. Yeah, well, I, 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 I can't take total credit for it. We've got an amazing team. Um, and so we, we get together on a weekly basis and say where we need to be, what we need to be doing, what we need to be working towards. Um, and we pivot and we shift and we do those things. And it's, um, it's exciting. Um, yeah. It's exciting to be part of this organization. It's exciting to be, uh, uh, to be, to be part of this industry for sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's it, and that's the truth. None of us do this alone. Yeah, absolutely. Well, well, it's great to great to talk. Uh, great to get to to dive in a little bit on some of these points. And I hope the people watching have found this useful. Um, Michael has put our websites up so that you can learn more about our organizations. And I'll uh, look forward to hopefully seeing you again soon. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Noah. I appreciate you hosting this. It was a wonderful chat. Um, thank, thanks for thanks for uh, stepping in and doing it. And um, yeah, looking forward to, to, to furthering the conversation down the road. All right. That sounds good. Take care, everybody.